Even um, us one, uh, so we, we will try to share the first one. Hello, everyone. My name is. Sorry. I don't know why it's not letting me. Fred, are you there? Ah, okay. I think, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why the video is here. That is. Let's try again. Okay. Here it is. So the first uh, video, and then uh, if you can tell me if we are, if you are seeing and or and hearing well the video, please. Uh, the first one is uh, legibility of design in collaborative computational practices from Libanu Erbil Altintes of the Ismia Institute of Technology, Turkey, and Altu Kasali. Uh, also from the Institute of the Ismi Institute of Technology in Turkey and Femi Dogan also from Turkey. Hello everyone, my name is Divan. We are attending the conference from Izmir Institute of Technology from Turkey. Our paper's title is Legibility of Design in Collaborative Computational Practices. Design bears a level of ambiguity which is also claimed to be accommodated within computational practices. It is also a key concern that the logic of computation and related morphologies necessitate a level of clarity in parameters and rules to be employed. It's not our intention at the outset to contrast the situations of ambiguity and clarity in design representation. Rather, following the accounts of the participants observed in this study, we frame it as an issue of legibility which has several key dimensions to further study. This study investigates and discusses the design process of two separate architectural offices where three teams of architects were tasked uh, with generating a schema in early phases of architectural design, primarily using computational design strategies. Through stated observations of collaborative computational practices, we investigate how design ideas are represented and externalized in a distributed cognitive system with the intention of achieving a legible schema to guide the design process. Through a series of field observations, we focus on how design teams cope with the ambiguity that leads to creative solutions while constructing legible knowledge propagation in a distributed cognitive system. In this research, we have employed the distributed cognition framework in order to account for the interactions occurring between human and non-human components of a system. Distributed cognition assumes that any task can be distributed across different parts of a system. The research tries to explore the mechanisms in developing particular solutions which require a level of coordination between participants of the cognitive system. Um, the research is a quadruple study consisting of ethnographic observations and interviews with three teams at two pioneering architectural offices in Turkey, especially specialized in the use of primitive modeling tools in architectural design process. In competition in project B, um, as a reflection of the rule-based approach in design, we have observed our participants to come up with eligible continuum linking design intentions to end product. 
so in a meeting, the team neither complained about the absence of the design rule yet legible for all. And she said, so what's the rule? The thing that bothers me is that I can't read it right away. Let me say, I can't read the distribution rule of these elements. Yesterday, everything was more legible. I mean, the design purposes. So on the sketches, we can identify the percentage values in numerical format to describe the effect of the openings uh, on the sur surface of the wall. So following the receipt, uh, then it was the coder's turn to process the sketch uh, by re-sketching the idea to come up with a formula on parametric design software, namely Grasshopper. So in this computation project, the team leader and the coder worked collaboratively and overcame the ambiguity in the design process with the risk catching to analyze and organize the next steps of the design. In this way, the team participants could set a legible process. And in the computation project A, now which is about an accommodation unit design, the coder explained the start of the design idea through a mathematical logic that's represented in the hand sketches. And you can follow in this illustration how the coder uh, applied the unit organization uh, by using, um, by setting rules. And she copies, rotates, and takes mirrors and adds some special units like handicap units. And at the end, she came up with the site organization. So following the logic, the coder applies a derivation method and repeats the logic according to the method in Grasshopper. In the competition C, after developing multiple but unsuccessful proposals, we have observed the team neither emphasizing the idea of design evolution through various images, which were the illustrations of an evolutionary processes for a vehicle design, Evolved from a biological form. Then the team leader explains what is the meaning of the evolution in design for them. He said, show the evolution of it. You should say, here it is. Then you jump to this. Then you jump to that. Then you jump to that. There is no such a thing here. So the cause epic relationship is broken. So the coders created multiple alternatives, but were not successful for the team leaders due to the absence of legible evolutionary process. At the end, one of the processes have led a proposal that you can see in the figure that was found as a successful in the way of demonstrating the evolutional process of the form. The team leader was evaluating the evolutional process as a logical chain that kept the main idea similar to the genetic information transmitted in nature. So the team participants were convinced that the last product has an evolutional logic, which makes the idea legible. In this ongoing research, the findings demonstrate the concept of legibility in design as a pivotal issue in the collaborative computation practices. The term legibility emerged mainly around two roads which occasionally overlap in design discussions. One is concerning clarity in communication and articulation of design intentions. Legibility was valued to make the developing morphology understandable to others. The second one, legibility, was also equally valued when designers want to explain and represent the logic of computational operations that govern the formal evolution of design. The team leader developed a sketch to express the idea to the coder. Then the coder sketched all of what he feared and the drawing phase uh, from the team leader and what he saw on the sketch that developed by the team leader. This sketching was appeared as a legibility tool. The uh, coder performed the sketching step as a synthesis phase of the initial sketch. Thus, he outlined the grasshopper definition. This illustration represents the design process according to the creation of legible space in the distributed work. The question in this research is that in the way parametric modeling tools are used in architectural offices, legibility in design preceded by the using by using the sketch tool as an idea generator and translator. The importance of distribution of cognitive process in a team and the interaction among the term them are emphasized. 
the interaction by its nature needs to be explicit as much as possible in the complex nature of design process. On the other hand, a research emphasizes if a team participants are not motivated to be explicit, the result of the production is more creative than the team which is motivated to be explicit and creative. It is emphasized improvisation in the interaction of the team, which leads to unpredictable and unexpected solutions which are innovative. Therefore, in this double-edged sword, design teams need to be both creative and legible in a distributed cognitive system. In an improvised communication, team participants need to be legible to conduct a fluid process. So we conclude that the concept of legibility and its various dimensions predominantly relate to the need to clarify and justify the core design drivers and approaches in form finally. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, um, Livano. And we will follow uh, with the next um, video. I think the order must be, uh, yeah, Luis. As universidades e sua manifestação territorial têm sido objeto de interesse científico nas últimas décadas. Let me read the title and the participants. It's visualizing connections social infrastructure at two Brazilian universities by uh, Luis Enrique uh, Pabang of uh, the University Federal of Santa Catarina, uh, Camila Poeta Mangrich from uh, Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina also, and uh, Lucas Fernandes de Oliveira, Gabriela Peglow Hartman, and Jose Ripa Cos also from the Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. As universidades e sua manifestação territorial têm sido objeto de interesse científico nas últimas décadas. No campus, elas amparam parte do desenvolvimento educacional, tecnológico e econômico das nações. A pandemia do Covid-19 atingiu brutalmente a educação, ao mesmo tempo que destacou a assistência que as universidades prestam, ressaltando seu papel de infraestrutura social. Neste trabalho, nós exploramos diagramaticamente as correlações das infraestruturas sociais e as tipologias em duas universidades públicas brasileiras, a cidade universitária da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Fundão, a cidade do Rio, e o campus da Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, no bairro Trindade, em Florianópolis. Partindo da onda de calor que atingiu Chicago em 1995, o sociólogo Eric Klinenberg coloca em evidência no meio científico o conceito de infraestrutura social relatando uma sequência de eventos que colapsaram o sistema infraestrutural da cidade. A diferença determinante nesses locais estava no que ele definiu como infraestrutura social, ou seja, nos locais físicos e organizações que moldam as maneiras pelas quais as pessoas interagem e que amparam essas interações. Leighton e Leighton, após a expressiva revisão de literatura sobre as infraestruturas sociais, acrescentam interpretações e novas associações acerca da teoria geral das infraestruturas, compreendendo-as como facilitadores de atividades os atores correlacionam as qualidades materiais, o design e a distribuição das infraestruturas sociais às outras redes de serviço, e como essas redes provisionam diferentes usos e atividades. Apesar de centrado nos Estados Unidos, a partir da análise de Rachel Solir, podemos traçar significativos paralelos entre a formulação territorial dos campos norte-americanos e dos brasileiros. Os apartamentos do autor constituem ferramentas de análise úteis, apreciadas, claro, as diferenças de contexto, que nos permitem abranger a missão e os objetivos das universidades. A UFRJ, fundada em 1920, e a implantação de seu principal campus na cidade do Rio de Janeiro tem longas histórias. A decisão pela era artificial que abriga a cidade universitária hoje deu-se em 1948. O plano elaborado tinha ênfase no saneamento e setorizava distintamente a administração, as unidades acadêmicas alojamentos e demais serviços auxiliares. Na UFSC, as discussões para definir a localização iniciam em 1950. O primeiro plano diretor foi concebido entre 55 e 56 e estabeleceu grande parte do traçado viário do campus. Os projetos incluem uma grande proposta feita por William Marx na década de 70, da qual somente uma reduzida parte foi implementada. 
A primeira etapa constitui uma aplicação crítica do estudo diagramático desenvolvido por Rajá Solívia para análise dos campos, mas nós consideramos aqui apenas as dimensões contexto e conectividade. Adaptando ao contexto da UFRJ e da UFSC, ambas as análises utilizaram bases cartográficas do OpenStreetMaps manuseadas na ferramenta QGIS. E, exclusivamente no caso da UFSC, nós utilizamos também a plataforma Kepler.gl para a visualização dos dados. A primeira análise focaliza o principal campus de cada uma das universidades, expandidas aos demais campi e unidades distribuídas nos contextos urbanos mais centrais da cidade sede de cada um. Nós podemos ver que a UFRJ dispõe de diversas outras unidades integradas ao distrito urbano central, que abrigam seu caráter de infraestrutura social, implicando na comunicação direta com a população da cidade do Rio de Janeiro. Na UFSC, os projetos de extensão estão concentrados em seu campo sede, integrado a uma área viária, enquanto as infraestruturas que se distribuem em outras unidades abrigam atividades de ensino e pesquisa mais isoladamente. No um segundo momento, o nosso recorte foi mais aproximado e focou na dimensão de conectividade. Nós utilizamos a rede viária acessível a pedestres do OpenStreetMaps. Os diagramas evidenciam a conectividade a partir dos acessos principais de cada um dos campos, em trajetos de até 30 minutos de caminhada e que consideram o relevo. Os resultados demonstram como o papel de coesão social das universidades públicas é amplo e relacional visto que além da provisão educacional dos estudantes, elas atuam na interação comunitária com a cidade. No sentido qualitativo, esses diagramas demonstram que o FRJ tem uma característica mais expansiva em relação ao meio urbano, ao passo que a UFSC acaba sendo um pouco mais contida em seu campo sede. O segundo estudo constitui uma avaliação qualitativa das infraestruturas sociais e suas derivações, feitas através de uma curadoria das plataformas online da UFRJ e da UFSC, avaliando ensino, pesquisa e projetos de extensão além dos seus planos institucionais. Comparados na revisão de Leighton Leire, as infraestruturas sociais distinguidas nas universidades foram infiltradas em áreas temáticas, que podem ser acompanhadas na coluna de tipologias. Em seguida, consideramos os lugares que abrigam essas categorias, adotando uma separação tipológica que resultou na identificação de 24 tipologias principais, que estão listadas na coluna de ações. Para as derivações das infraestruturas sociais dentro das tipologias, foram consultadas as cartas de serviço de ambas as universidades, que é um documento que fornece aos cidadãos quais são os serviços prestados pelas organizações públicas e como se dá o acesso a esses serviços. Também foram coletados manualmente nas páginas dessas instituições notícias relacionadas aos programas de assistência e de extensão, como no caso da Associação Amigos do Hospital Universitário, na UFSC, ou a interação com programas da sociedade civil organizada, e também dos municípios, como no caso do Movimento União Rio e do Hospital Universitário da UFRJ. Neste segundo estudo, uma visão sistêmica das infraestruturas, focada na tipologia, e que visava ultrapassar os três pilares que orientam as universidades públicas, mostrou-se mais adequada aos novos paradigmas científicos contemporâneos. No estudo 3, consideramos uma visualização espacial das informações previamente identificadas, aplicadas nesse caso somente ao campo estendade como protótipo, principalmente pela característica de concentrar a maior parte das atividades e das dinâmicas da UFSC. As tipologias foram agrupadas e já referenciadas no QGIS e as ações foram organizadas no Kepler.gr, em circuitos que testem o sistema de infraestruturas sociais do campus. Na tela a gente pode acompanhar o nome de todos esses circuitos. As conexões entre as tipologias formam uma rede pela interpolação dos circuitos com mais superposições de ações, através da triangulação de Delonai. Deste modo, apresentamos na imagem atendimento transgeracional, desenvolvimento físico, cursos e minicursos, competições esportivas, atividades de lazer da comunidade, prevenção e reabilitação cardiorrespiratória, exibições e mostras de audiovisuais, espetáculos e concertos, e aqui todos os circuitos anteriores sobrepostos. A conectividade acadêmica e social fica mais clara neste estudo no qual a setorização é superada por uma rede de eixos que são distribuídos pelo campus. Nesses diagramas, a visão transdisciplinar também pode ser aplicada aos vínculos de sociabilidade necessários às infraestruturas sociais e que permeiam, nesse sentido, todos os sistemas de áreas livres urbanas. Pela ênfase gráfica e discussão sistêmica, o caráter híbrido deste trabalho projeta uma percepção efetiva das infraestruturas sociais distribuídas nos territórios universitários. Os diagramas buscaram entender essa percepção perpassando sistemas sociotécnicos que são entrelaçados em redes de componentes físicos, sociais e também institucionais. Observou-se como a capilaridade dessas infraestruturas nas cidades permite que elas compõem partes decisivas dos sistemas complexos urbanos. 
A disposição sistêmica das infraestruturas reforça a presença das universidades enquanto entidade urbana, servindo como importante suporte também às municipalidades. A compreensão de como as suas ações se relacionam e estão intrincadas em seu espaço edificado oferece apontamentos mais preciosos, social e territorialmente, acerca da importância do campus enquanto uma infraestrutura social. Conferimos a esses diagramas, portanto, a tarefa de iluminar as interações sociais em direção ao campus que seja mais plural, inclusive conectado. Well, uh, obrigado, uh, time de Luis. And next one is uh, Pitruvia. I don't know if uh, the authors are here, but uh, the video is the 83. It's called uh, Pitruvia. Interactive Augmented Reality for Early Design Stages, Stage Applications uh, by Taeyong Kim, the Harvard Graduate School of Design in the US, and also from the same place uh, by George uh, Waida or Gita and Don Jung Kim. Hi, everyone. We are uh, Kim Jesney, Taeyong Kim, George Gaida, and Don Jung Kim. Our project name is B2B AR, Interactive Augmented Reality for All Design Stage Applications. So over the last few years, Augmented Reality has emerged as an increasingly valuable tool in architecture and design practice. It is commonplace to use this technology in the visualization and fabrication standard and non-standard geometries through the uses of headset and mobile devices. In this paper, we present B2B AR an AR-based prototype that assists designers in early design stages. By focusing primarily on the ideation process, we will introduce method to rethink traditional design tools through three methods, freeform, additive, and computational silly sketching. By explaining this framework, we will describe the accessible user interface used to tie mobile AR app to generative workflow and conclude with limitation and future outlooks. AR technologies have developed significantly within the architecture discipline, particularly the assembly and piece of fabrication workflow. In the same way, 3D printers are decentralizing the manufacturing process. AR and VR technologies are creating new methods for humans to access and create information. The, 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 the democratization of expertise through easy and straightforward holographic guidance demonstrates large shifts in traditional drawing-based workflow. This change has challenged the role of craftsmen uh, while giving them new and integrated possibilities. However, existing sketching tool uh, provides limited sketching method, making it challenging for our users to interact with the physical world in different ways. Thus, the project's first ambition is to challenge these limitations, giving access to all users, suggesting three different sketching methods utilizing the ubiquitous de devices, such as smartphone or a tablet. Also, this project seeks to provide architectural assembly tools and integrate different design programs also, such as Grasshopper and Unity. This project uses the smartphone and PC to provide multiple early design stage workflows, more accessible and inclusive. On the front end, we use the gaming engine Unity with the plugin AR Foundation and AR Core for the smartphone application. On the back end, data is transferred wirelessly to the PC via user datagram protocol and allow the, the users to modify and visualize data through Grasshopper and C Sharp scripts. The UI includes the scaling, rotating, coloring, adding, and deleting of models and placing the base plane, which is used for the placement of the other objects. Also, users can select the mod modality of the design methods and the UI for the UDP includes in the input for the UDP address selection of the port number and the toggle button to activate in the UDP communication. Three design methods were created to provide users with tools intended to facilitate early architectural design stages. First is Freedom 3D Sketching. It uses the point to, to on the AI environment as vertices of mesh structure. 
and each vertices can be added on the base plane and transformed by dragging XYZ geometry, which is called Gumpel. So we used, so the users can design their own geometry according to the air environment. The second method includes the user, use of predefined primitive geometries and the user uploaded 3D scan objects as building blocks for users to design architectural spaces within the AI environment. Geometry in this method remains unconstrained by heights or physics systems and can be stacked or placed irregularly. Also, the data can be transferred to the PC through UDP and the users can define their own geometries or building material manually or through Grasshopper as explained in the next step. The last design method, computational 3D sketching, overcomes the limitation of remotely using hand, handheld devices as seen in the previous two methods. By connecting the AR workflow with the computational capabilities of Grasshopper, users can design parametric structures intuitively. To test this customizable workflow, we developed a system of self-generating arc structures from the user-defined point data from the air environment. Vitruvior is a tool that suggests the potential of augmented reality within early design stages within the architectural design process, ranging from free-form mesh generation and ob object manipulation integrated computational workflows. The possibilities within prefabrication stages are numerous. By developing this intuitive user interface and through initial user testing, this prototype suggests a platform where experienced users can integrate their own computational workflows and inexperienced users can use offline uh, tools within with predefined um, modalities. These three methods of sketching in augmented reality suggests new forms of engaging and interacting within the city and new forms of education and spatial learning. This additionally offers the opportunity to design freely and ev evaluate solutions that are not necessarily optimized through the AR experience. Two principal limitations relate to real-time communication and accessibility of advanced workflows. In the case of computational 3D sketching within this pipeline the real-time communication is constrained to Wi-Fi distances, limited by the implementation of the UDP method. And limitations and accessibility relate to the creation of custom computational workflows, as well as the requirement to downsize uh, 3D scanned objects. In conclusion, virtual VR demonstrates the potential of mobile AR within early de design stages. It provides insights into new ways in which multiple users can sketch and ideate projects on and off site. This establishes the potential for a continuous workflow in AR from initial design to and visualization stages to the fabrication and construction stages. Benefits of this process can include real time designers, representation, greater accessibility, intuitive view, user interfaces for within the design process. Reduce, reduce design complexity and potential for improved educational benefits. Ultimately, Retrove VR seeks to establish new conversations on architectural design ideation through a mobile and accessible user interface for experiences, experienced and non-experienced designers alike. We'd like to thank Jose Luis Castillo uh, from the GSD for his continuous support within the process. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Thank you, George and the other authors. And then uh, we have the, the last video. Hello. It's uh, the if I if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, the Hi-Fi House uh, and the Paperless Worksite uh, by Victor Sandenberg from the Leibniz uh, Universität uh, Hannover in Germany and Anna Luisa Rolin from uh, 
Universidade Católica de Pernambuco em Brasil, e also from Pernambuco, Diego de Gian Domenico, and uh, from the Caesar School in Pernambuco, also uh, André Figueiredo, Rafael Rates de Aguiar, and also from the Universidad Católica de Pernambuco, Clarissa Duarte. Hello, we're presenting the paper, The Hyphy House and the Paperless Worksite. Uh, we speculate on collaboration methods between machines and humans on the construction site and discuss the potential limitations encountering the design and construction of a one-to-one -one scale prototype named the Hyphy House, which was built without printed construction drawings. These drawings were replaced with uh, AR, uh, augmented reality, via smartphones. Formalized, the focus is on the structure and growth process of the mushroom, particularly uh, its hyphae, in the broad context of the minimal essential house. An AR exhibit was also designed to extend the didactic and hyper-reality nature of the experiment. This research was done uh, during a postgraduate degree program in design technology that focused on contemporary technologies in architecture and design biomimicry, parametric modeling, and AR tools that culminated in the said prototype. We worked with uh, three design constraints. The first was to use an affordable locally produced material consisting of a standard hollow concrete block. The second was to employ an aggregate as the only extra resource other than the blocks themselves. And the third was to refine design and build a prototype in five days. So the building material was a hollow concrete block measuring 29 by 19 by 14 centimeters produced by a local partner company um, and a biomass ready to use uh, mortar. The overall intention behind this choice was to use an accessible simple product to generate complex geometries, expanding the technique of uh, standard parallel stacking. Um, various tools and media were used throughout the process, including mock-ups in multiple scales, 3D prints, parametric models, sketch, renderings, and various visualizations of the proposals in one-to-one -one scale in AR. The source of inspiration is the hyphae or branched filamental structure characterized by long cylindrical fungal cells with multiple nuclei. Pre-existing reference projects are the walls of the Gantenbein wine yards built by robotic arm by Gramatson Cover in 2006. Or the Koblogo projects, where concrete blocks were located at specific angles according to CNC milled and laser cut uh, templates by SubDV Architecture in Sao Paulo in 2013. No digital fabrication machinery or technical drawings was used in the process. And the main challenge was to test the feasibility of AR with smartphones to design and construct the prototype. AR proved to be a powerful didactic tool, especially during the COVID pandemic, since most students already owned the necessary hardware, in other words, a computer and smartphones. Cement blocks are generally used orthogonally due to low cost and construction agility, with technical drawings usually describing the position of the blocks without incorporating non orthogonal angles, uh, which would possibly, at least that's what's ar uh, argued, it would lead to inaccuracy and higher labor costs. But based on precedents, we know that digital manufacturing technologies have expedited construction of designs where each component is positioned at a different angle. Um, but digital machinery still remains away from the vast majority of construction sites. So in our case, we decided to use smartphones because it's a widely available tool in construction sites, but not yet used for directly in construction. So we would depend upon training the workers, in that case, the students. So a seven meter by 12 meters grid was deployed over the construction site then populated with QR codes placed every one meter, which were used for referencing the location of smartphones in the physical space. The geometry of the prototype was further developed and adapted to the sites with the support of Rhino and Grasshopper. Pairs of students with smartphones running the Phonogram app placed each block on the worksite. 
With smartphones demonstrating the relevant information for the role being constructed, these pairs of workers were alternated without detriment to understanding and continuity in fabrication. Due to some inaccuracies regarding the location marks pointed out through smartphones, after a few minutes of use, as discrepancies between the digital model and the physical prototype were observed, the position and device via QR codes had to be re-referenced. To facilitate the understanding of the overlay of the blocks of the digital model, we isolated only the most relevant information to be displayed for each pair of builders. The geometry was represented in translucent blue, which allowed the physical block to be seen. Using as a reference for positioning the blocks, the perimeter of its top face was indicated in red. The perimeter of the intersection between the blocks on each row was represented in green, facilitating the visualization of the location of the aggregate. As for results, result number one, I pointed out that our uh, experiment uh, by using AR in the building phase turned out to be feasible without the use of construction zones. Um, we also uh, should point that given the current stage of smartphone self-referencing technology, our experiment confirmed the tolerance of precision in the range of 0.1 to 3 centimeters in the location of the blocks. Um, we should also say that the construction took two afternoons with pairs of uh, workers working simultaneously. And um, we estimate that this was about four times faster than regular construction, which would require transferring all the drawings to the site first and then actually building the object. Uh, result number four, uh, we should say that the use of the ready to use biomass mortar product really expedited the, pro uh, the process of construction. Uh, we should also point that some factors like sunstroke and visual pollution, pollution sometimes compromise the access to the visualization of AR exhibition. And that when you, uh, users moved away from reference images, there were also some registration failures. I would like to conclude pointing that this prototype demonstrates that AR challenged one of the architect's most common tasks, the production of printed construction drawings. With the advent of smartphones, we have become accustomed to having computers in our pockets all day long. As Colomina and Mark Wigley says, there are more active cell phones on the planet than people. By relying on this condition, we identified two major advances. Computers are coming out of our pockets and into our heads ever so smoothly. And we can interact with such devices through gestures that define what we are seeing, allowing a new wave of professions to be transformed. Finally, we would like to point that we see the possibility of visualizing information on the construction site from several layers of the 3D model in a specific site and in a one-to-one -one scale, facilitating the understanding of the project among by its several actors without the need to interface with physical drawings. Thank you very much, Victor and the team, and Ala, Anna and the team. Uh, so now we can go to uh, the questions. Let me stop sharing the screen. Yeah. So uh, now we can go to uh, comments and questions. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I want to, to start uh, introducing me again. I'm Rodrigo Martin Iglesias from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. And with me uh, co-hosting this, this session is Leonardo Parra Agudelo from Colombia. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to open the questions and comments between yourselves. Uh, I have several questions here, here in comments, but I want to, you to, to make questions or comments between you. Um, are there any? <laughs> well, anyways, I have some, and, and I think that Leonardo also has some yes. questions and comments. Do you want to start, Leo? 
Sure. Why not? Yeah. Um, yes. So hello, everyone. So um, I'm really happy to be here. And um, I find your work really, really interesting. I think there's um, a bunch of things that are uh, actually changing how I see technology and how it could be used. Um, but I also see a lot of issues in how these things are being framed, which is great, right? That's why we're here. Um, <clears throat> so I have, I have a few general comments. Um, when reading your papers and, and um, seeing your presentations, I, I was asking myself questions about the politics of the process, uh, the politics of the technologies that you're using and the politics of design as applied to you know, many disciplines, you know, like industrial design or UX or architecture or whatever. Um, and uh, the, the biggest thing that popped in my head was related to the situatedness of each project, right? So for example, in Vitruvr, I, the big question that I had was, or was related to the integration of local materials and sensibilities, which was something that we saw in the last project that was presented, right? And so there's, there's a few tensions in what we've seen so far that are really interesting because you know, it begs the question of what does it mean? What, what does it, we're doing these things, but what do they mean in, in, in particular contexts? Right, so I was I was thinking about, um, okay, how do we, how do I, could bring, for example, the Truvr to Colombia, and how it could be possible to use, you know, like there's different problems in terms of technologies. Yes, a lot of people are using phones and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean that people in Colombia would have access to smartphones, right? They some people would even go to certain places and rent phones for making phone calls, right? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the politics of the technology, right? Um, I, I, I'm maybe, uh, if I understood you well, uh, maybe something uh, related to the local significance of yes. experience? Yes, so maybe the local significance I, of the technology, yes. Yeah, so maybe if someone of you want to talk about that, the, the, what do you think is the local significance of your um, tool development, technology development and, and experiences? It's an open question for all of you. Yeah, George. Thanks, Leonardo. I, I think it's, it's a really interesting question and clearly we framed it within a very different context to the one yeah. you might be in. We're in Boston, and, um, sure. yeah. but it's it's really great to have seen the second presentation, which in which the discussion, for example, becomes yes, you're right. Local materials. Can we begin talking about performative uh, buildings or um, accessibility to certain materials vis-à-vis -vis the technology? So I think it's definitely. Uh, a great example of an application within these scenarios. And I'm sure there are many more. So uh, looking at, for in our case, introducing a scanned 3D object and finding its application both from a constructive and early design perspective, but also from a, a vernacular. Could you, yes. uh, could you begin having these wider discussions from the very first moment of design? Thank you, George. Yeah, George, um, thank you. Anyone else that want to address the issue of the local significance? Um, well, we have we, we built this uh, object. Our experience was done in the northeast of Brazil, which is uh, the country is one of the country's poorest regions. But the country as a whole, ninety percent. I think the number is ninety three percent, and Victor can correct me, of families 
of households, they own cell phones. And uh, the technology that we use is intrinsically connected to modern architecture, the, the birth of modern architecture in Brazil, which is the Cobogó or the hollow block. So for us, it was very kind of almost, how do we put together these two scenarios of something, maybe it's the old vernacular and the new vernacular because cell phones are becoming something like that, almost a vernacular tool, if you wish. I think is the most common tool in Brazil is a cell phone nowadays. So just to throw it out there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you wanna, Victor? Yeah, there was a, a, a element of democratization of technology because if you look the this these structures that are wall like made of repetitive industrial elements that are rotated to specific angles, this is something that we have been seeing in architecture in conference like that for at least fifteen years. But at the first moment, it was with super expensive, large industrial robots, and then a little bit cheaper um, drones, and then a little bit cheaper CNC and laser cutters. And now, finally, with AR and smartphones, the, the investment required to build such a structure is around $2,000. That's for the construction industry, it's not. Uh, so high, even for a context like a third world country like Brazil. Thank you, Victor. Um, well, uh, if anyone wants to, to address uh, the, the, the issue, the question, or maybe we can leave it for, for later. I have another question also. Um, for the, um, the presentation from Turkey, um, I think it, it's, it's very nice that we had uh, two presentations around the um, first ideas of design, like the, the first sketches. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these two presentations are quite different in the approach to how to uh, cope with this, with these uh, first ideas, because I think that, um, I mean, in a way, uh, true VR or true VAR, uh, it's it's dealing with this um, how to use these uh, sketches somehow in real time, in 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 real scenarios, let's say, and. Um, and the other um, presentation, it's it's uh, dealing more with this uh, problem of the uh, legibility or the readability of the these first ideas. And I was thinking about um, uh, on one hand, if if you are uh, somehow assuming that design is a language. So we are talking about legibility or readability because we are trying to think a, a design as a language. And, and if that, uh, if there is a relationship with shape grammars there, if you, if you know that, and um, yeah, let's, let's make this first question because it will get more complex otherwise. Um. Um, actually, um, the, in the in the research, um, um, we are not relating this legibility issue with the shape grammar because it's not uh, like just only with the shapes. Yeah, they they reading the shapes, but uh, there there is also some uh, let's say like conceptual issues, just not reading with with the shapes. So um, I mean, uh, it's more than the shapes they try to understand behind the ideas because uh, in the uh, projects that I mentioned uh, it's computation projects which they need to um, relate the, their ideas uh, by uh, ex by drawing but not with the just I know the shape grammars issues but it's not just only the shape grammars uh, it's more yeah, I know. yeah it's it's more like 
um, related with the digital technologies with, with this research, um, we are trying to relate with this um, collaboration issues with this um, part. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. Let, let me reframe or, or re rethink the question. Um, if you uh, take away the shape, uh, the shapes or the morphology or the topology of the drawings, mm -hmm. what's, uh, you know, what's uh, um, the result or, or what's uh, besides that? What's in an idea, yeah. you know? What's yeah, yeah, in I an idea? yeah. Or let's say a sketch, because mm -hmm. an idea is it's, it's mm -hmm. maybe it's too open uh -huh. in a sketch. I, what's, actually, what's beside that? Yeah, actually, uh, I mean with the sketches, sometimes they um, introduce their ideas with numerical things. They just want to explain their cells, uh, even they, when they trying to transfer their ideas to the computational softwares like Grasshopper, they, they were just dealing with the numbers, for instance. Or sometimes they use some terms like uh, evolution, and they want to um, see this evolution idea in their design. It's not only the shapes, it's um, they, they want uh, apply the con concept of that evolution concept, for instance, or they just dealing with the numbers and then the shapes came out, but um, they didn't start with the shapes, for instance. Okay, great. Because I think that that mm -hmm. uh, conceptual part, I think that in a way it's mm -hmm. kind of um, um, uh, given a new uh, significance to the term uh, legibility or readability if you think about concepts also not only shapes mm -hmm. and, and morphologies mm -hmm. uh um leo the leo do you do you have a, a questions i have yes well look i have a million <laughs> questions i don't hear i don't think we have time for yeah, all the questions too, I, I have. we have the time uh, actually <laughs> we have like a half an hour to, to yeah. talk. <laughs> half an hour left yeah okay 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 that's not that's not long um, look, I think I'm just going to go through a couple of things um, just to give you all a little bit of um, a couple of things from each project. So, for example, uh, this, this project, the legibility of design in collab computational practices, there's a few things that I find really interesting. Uh, you are trying to make this a sort of uh, like a numerical sort of parametric thing while using a qualitative approach that aims at finding the spectrum in which a phenomenon exists, right? So trying to understand something with numbers, but then your approach is qualitative. Um, mm -hmm. So there's the tension there that's super interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a, a couple of other things that I find really interesting that uh, you should consider in the future. For example, you, you looked at two uh, organizations, like two offices, right? But then um, I think maybe it'd be interesting to consider if uh, certain people or certain participants come from certain schools, if they have uh, internal codes, if there's a sort of best practices, sort of uh, guidelines, um, what's the, you know, consider the problems of protecting um, what's being done. So, for example, people might talk about something, but they might not talk about other things because they don't want to make them visible in a research context. Um, and also the types of relationships and relations, the types of relationships and structures of power. And this is this this is a comment for all, all the papers that we've seen today, um, because these things actually modify how people engage the projects and the processes and the results. So that's that, that, that's one thing. I'm just gonna go quickly through everything. Um, for example, the Vitru VR, uh, the paper states that this change has challenged the role of crafts, craftsmen while giving them new and integrated possibilities. And I kind of disagree with that a little bit because you're basically displacing craft to a different domain, right? So you're making the craft the development bit. Um, and that's really interesting. This goes back to uh, types of relationships and, and, and notions of power and how that sort of applies to your work. Um, whew, 
this is quick. Um, I also think that maybe maybe uh, we can let them uh, answer. Guys, I have the, comments. The question yes, or the comment. Sure. Yeah, please, uh, Taejong or Don Jung. If you want to, to yeah, what do you think about displacing the craft to a different domain? Because you're saying this is for untrained designers, and what happens when they are trained, and what happens when they want to change their tool? Yeah, that is a really great point. And yeah, so our applications try to be really ubiquitous. So to be honest, so if they if there's someone who can use the C sharp script and Grasshopper really well, then they of course they can use the extend their ability connecting our application to the Grasshopper ability is really great for really scaled workers. And if only if this, so if non-skilled worker try to expand their experience, then they can learn how to use Grasshopper and how to use the C sharp script and jump into the Grasshopper and expand their design ability. And, but there's definitely, there's some users that really try to have fun with the design and scale up and down the materials and to just sketch them what they want. In this case, you can just propose, you can just add support, you can just suggest them to use the mesh, freeform mesh design and stacking bricks or stack, stack, stacking 3D scan object as they want or scaling up and down the materials and modify. Yep. Yeah. I hope that this can answer your question now, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, but it's interesting. It's interesting because it's placing the craft, you know, like if I am a trained designer and I don't have the knowledge to modify things, then what happens, right? So again, this goes back to you changing the world, but what does that mean? So yeah, yeah. interesting, yeah. Yeah, in that case, I, was... I should appreciate, really appreciate the AR fabrication world so that make the AR design into the real world that... Diana's project suggests this. So, you know, but our project, our project is much more concentrated on the design itself. So if we apply the, you know, really physics of the real environment in air design, like gravities and frictions or something like that, then, you know, the object should fall down and everywhere else. And, you know, it's crashing each other and it's booming, you know, it's the demolish itself. But in our case, we just wanted to stick on air, on the somewhere air, and you know, allow the users to modify that point or the material on the sky. So, yeah, right, yeah. So what you said means that the limitations that you presented are not just those limitations, right? There's yeah. more limitations. <laughs> yeah, There's plenty more. So yeah. Anyway, uh, that was fun. <laughs> anyway, you wanna <laughs> you wanna you wanna say something, bro? Because I have tons of yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have tons of, of questions and comments also. Uh, but I want to, to relate to two uh, presentations. I think that, um, well, one is the, the, the VTRU VR in, uh, about the possibility of, of sharing the, this kind of uh, sketches or models to make it more collective. I, I know that it, it, uh, you don't reach, you didn't reach the stage of, of, of um, collaborative work but but maybe sharing it's it's something in the middle yeah i also we also really care about this so you know udp communication method is one of the methods to sharing the data from the grasshopper and the smartphone so it's a really real time based communication so but the problem of the udp is it's really hard to communicate in a really really big size of data from each other so in that case we definitely can save the the model file from local local folder of the smartphone and transfer it to the somewhere else in the PC or some or the other smartphone and visualize it. So yeah. you know if you use the collaborative work, then in the really low rate of visualization is possible. But if we try the really high visualization quality with a really fancy materials on on it, and I think yeah, I think it is so far is kind of difficult because we use the Galaxy S7 for the approach, for approachable device, device is it's not yeah. less than $100 at Walmart. So <laughs> in that case, I think it's also related to the politics, but for the you know affordable or approachable device, this device, we use the really cheap device for our experience for that reason. So 
yeah, for kind of sharing. So it's also really restri restricted to the hardware of the device. If it is really advanced, as it, and it will definitely advance in the future. In that case, we definitely can share the high visualized, high quality of models each other. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, in a way, it's like we are dealing with uh, even in 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 the. Um... In the presentation uh, from uh, the Hyphy House, it's like we are dealing with uh, um, ideas that are, uh, are going beyond the capacity of our technology today, in a way, because we are we are assuming that technology will go uh, faster and will have a much more um, um, I don't know a, a, a better let's say computational capacity in the future we are assuming that in in a way i think but uh, uh, in uh, related to the thing about sharing i was wondering if uh, the presentation of uh, santa catarina if um these kind of diagrams that you make uh, it's it's okay if i talk in english sorry luis okay if if this kind of uh, diagrams of uh, connectivity and and this kind of uh, social technical mapping that you are doing uh, can somehow feed back uh, to the databases that you that you used previously to build the map, you know what I mean? If if you can feed back the information not only for you but also for the the use of the general public. Because in a way, it's kind of asking for that, no? Yeah, can I answer or not? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of our goal, uh, actually, but we we still can do that. Um, we are still researching it. In a way, it's a, a work that's in, it's kind of the beginning, but we we are looking for. All the infrastructures we have in the university campus and that today they are uh, administrated by different sectors so this is our main boundary because it impacts how we collect the data so uh, when when we said we were kind of curating data from the university's web pages that, that, that is kind of true because you don't you don't have a system for all infrastructures but we are still kind of designing that so we we can present to the administration so uh, i'm pretty sure we can feedback to them but that's uh, a long run i guess <laughs> okay so it's in in a way it's it's like your purpose uh, at the end yeah. of the the whole research but but you're not reaching the, this point yet yeah, like we're we not okay. there yet. Okay, okay. Oh, great. And 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 talking about feedback, I was asking myself if um, I mean regarding this this reference that you made about uh, Gramazio and Coda, um, if you are thinking about uh, an a way to for this AR uh, somehow feedback the model uh, at the meantime you are building uh, these this walls, these structures. Because in the Gramazio color experiences, most of the time they are feedbacking the, the model at the same time. So I, I'm asking myself if, if you thought about that. Right now, we are basically turning the human via having like a smartphone on their heads into a robot, a very cheap robot, which doesn't sound like a great future for our species. Uh, so basically what our proposal is doing is uh, making a normal worker through digital means able to replicate what was done with robots in 10, 10 years ago. Um, yeah, um, I think that it would be like a really interesting approach to, to AR, like what the third 
group presented before. And it could also, having this feedback loop, we could also correct some misalignments that we have from, from uh, the imprecision of the smartphone. That probably would not happen with the with a more sophisticated and expensive device like the HoloLens. But yeah, that would be uh, improve our imperfections from our model. Thank you very much, Victor. It's very interesting the idea of a yep. human turning into robots because you know the the origin of the of the word robot that is re very related to forced work to to slavery in a way. So it's uh, kind of uh, provoking to think about that and how it will uh, impact in our work environments. Uh, Tae Young, I think you have a question or comment. Yeah, um, is the author also allowed to ask questions? <laughs> okay, Absolutely. that's great. Yeah, thank you so much. So, and I have a question about the same project, so, so AR Bricks. So, um, uh, I think really a kind of technical question. So um, I know calibration, calibration is really important while doing the fabrication. So I saw the QR code is, is placed in like a grid system on the ground and the, the brick walls is going around the, the, the grid. But so I just wanted to ask about the workflow. So the QR grid comes first or the design comes first? <laughs> Anna, do you want to go? It's fine, you can go. It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great yeah, question. That's a great question. Uh, what happened is that it was, again, sort of loops between uh, different phases of design. Always going through sketches, through physical models. So what happened is that at the end, we adapted some ideas to the grid. So they come together and, and one chant the other. But something that was very interesting for me about the grid is we were teaching the seminar and there was around 12 students and we asked like three or four of them hey can you just go to the site and put this grid there and i thought that it would take two hours but two days later they were still having problems with that and so it was half of the time dealing to finding a proper way to put it very precisely, this simple uh, uh, one meter by one meter grid, and the other days was to build the more complicated thing, which mainly proves how AR can also speed uh, construction, because we didn't use AR to, uh, to place the grid, but once we have it, it became really fast. And we should note that that was kind of a flat site. So if it was some topographic changes, then I don't know exactly how long it would take or what kind of improvisation we'd have to deal. So luckily, I think that was our first experiment and choosing a flatter sort of site was a way to start, but we know that it's a limitation um, that we should expand. Yeah, but I think it's a really great approach. And also, you know, so we can predefine the location of QR code in the, the 3D model, like PC. So I'm pretty sure that like really curvature geometry or really like have a step, a site. So it, it also can op applicable in this site too. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have, I have a question for the um, a paperless worksite team and um, Luis, I guess. And um, how, how do you see your project um, integrating empirical knowledge from people, right? So the universities as infrastructure, you know, you're looking at a lot of numbers, but there's a lot of experience embedded within those sites that's also important in terms of constituting that um, infrastructure. And, um, you know, when it comes to AR, 
you know, and you're teaching students, but then there's a whole lot of people that know how to do these things well, that, you know, might uh, grow and stop building things. But how do you, how do you foresee your projects integrating that sort of empirical knowledge into what you're doing? I don't know, Victor or Luis. Okay, I'm thinking here. Uh, oh, no, you can go first, please. I, I was just saying that I was thinking how to, in terms of empirical knowledge, I was just, um, you know, where this project was built, there's a huge tradition on building with uh, blocks and building blocks, but simple ones. So I think it would have to be some, almost like a, some retrofit. So you have to teach the tool, get feedback, and then retrofit <laughs> the thing. So the thing can become manageable by all levels of workers. So I don't think I have an answer to say what, I mean, we'd have to go and teach people this tool to then capture maybe what they would empirically do if we just say what they could do and then start from there right. other than just say, do this, do that, and do that. I don't know if that answers a little right. bit. Of I, was, I, was more, I was thinking about, um, you know, construction workers that have the experience that they've done these things for okay. years. And that's, you know, they know a lot of things. And now you're bringing this new thing and you're sort of starting from scratch, but maybe you shouldn't. And that's, that's where my question was aiming at. I don't know if that makes sense. It definitely does. In fact, uh, during the construction, we were very lucky to have two construction workers with us. In fact, it was them who solved the QR grid problem. So right. we, we already learned from, from, nice. from empirical knowledge in practice. And, but they were very interested and they, they were very excited to see how it is intuitive to go not through some abstract language of technical drawings with strange ideas like orthographic projection or scale or like what means specific kinds of hatches but to really go and see one-to-one -one and be really like a game that you just go and you put it in place but uh, i always ask myself that so hey here we are people with years and years of academy and uh, fancy titles from fancy schools and we are trying to build this this wall and it's like what it means to, to put so much effort and so much technology right to build a prototype like that it's still a good question for me right absolutely interesting thank you absolutely yeah I think in a way, when we talk about these this, um, experiences that are dealing with technology that maybe it's not yet here in the way of uh, computational capacity or, or even, um, I don't know, the broadband or something like that. Um, I think that uh, in a way you have the opportunity there to detect uh, issues that we will face in the future. So uh, in a way, I think that's that's a, a very, um, not only interesting, but, but also valuable, um, um, yeah, uh, thing to, to take into account in these kind of experiences that are trying to uh, move the limit or, or the boundary of our technology and our way to deal with that technology. For example, uh, what you said about the workers uh, com, uh, transforming and, into robots, I think uh, if you wait for that scenario, when the, the workers are really like robots, um, in a way we, we will be a little late for, for coping with this kind of uh, problems or issues. So it's, it's, uh, it makes a lot more sense to make this kind of uh, experimental experiences uh, a little 
speculative in terms of technology because you are you are expecting that the technology will um, will advance or will progress uh, in the way, for example, that you can make a, a 3D scanning of the topography to feed back in a loop the construction of the wall and so on. But but in a way, if if you are thinking about that now, you can foresee these kind of issues, I think, and that's very valuable. Um, so in that way, thank you very much for that. And, and I have um, another question, and in a way it's relate, related to that, but in, the, in, the, in terms of uh, how technology are dealing with complexity. That is, uh, uh, it's not only the, the um, let's say the, the knowledge that we have in, in our people, in our culture, but also the complexity of certain things or phenomena. And, and for example, in, in Vitru VAR, uh, you said something about uh, reducing the design complexity. I, I understand why, but in a way, I'm, I'm asking myself if that is not um, conspiring against design in a way. And uh, in, the, um, in the paper from Turkey, you said, um, something about the relationship of cause effect. And, and in a way, the, this kind of readability or legibility, I think that somehow sometimes can be also be conspiring against this um, ambiguity uh, that the sketches has uh, or have um, that in a way allows um, to uh, allows complexity to appear, if you know what I mean, because design is, is a complex thing, in, more in terms of the sketching part of, of design, that is the more open part, the, in a way it has to be the more open part of design, because you will deal, you will deal there with this kind of, for example, um, abduction jumps, you know? And, and it's, it's very, uh, it's kind of far away from this kind of linear and, and reductive way to think about these uh, early stages. Well, but, but, but I think it's a, it's a complex problem. Uh, what do you think about it? Livanur or? Yes, 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 you are right. Uh, you will yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really complex issue and we, try to observe all these issues in an, at like site in the site. Um, so this ambiguity is also a key element for the creativity. So it's related in, in the observations, uh, the team leader mentioned the, this cause and effect issue. And they want to relate this cause effect with legibility in the mean of like evolutionary because they think um, they can read the project clearly, the idea, they can read the idea clearly with uh, reading this cause effect. So they, they were trying to apply this idea in computational tools also. Uh, so it, at the end, they just um, try to read all evolutionary process of the tower project from the beginning to the end. Um, yeah, um, like uh, maybe we can add also this, like uh, rather than uh, viewing design as a text, um, like we would like to see it as a like series of representations. So um, we observe the designers to employ a series of representations like text, numbers, sketches, this kind of uh, materials to achieve um, a level of legibility, which they find important. Um, they, they were applying this legibility issue from the beginning the, in their design process. So uh, we try to account for all this through a narrative based on our site observations. I, I hope I could answer the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, because I, I think that ambiguity and, and also mm -hmm. randomness and haphazardness uh, play a, a big role there in, in these mm -hmm. early stages of, of uh, sketching yeah. design. So 
uh, that I think that's a, a problem to, to, to face mm -hmm. when you're dealing with this computational tool in this in these stages. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenging know. issue because computational doesn't leave space for ambiguity, but design should be amb ambiguous to, because they find this creativity, uh, it's related with this ambiguity. So it, it's really challenging issue and we want to see that issue in the site while observing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that mm -hmm. um, the notion of agency that comes from social studies of technology could be mm -hmm. really useful for you to sort of explore these issues mm -hmm. further mm -hmm. and, you know, perhaps look at act actor network theory and yeah. things like that. Um, yeah. That might, that might you know, give you, yeah. give you like a broad space to explore and, and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, um, I, I use distributed cognition <laughs> theory. So it uh, takes like agency issues also. So uh, thank you very much for your yeah, ideas. Yeah, because one of the things that sort of popped up in my head when I was reading the paper, mm -hmm. uh, most of the quotes come from leaders rather than, rather than coders. And mm -hmm. I was asking myself, why is that? Why is it that the leader is more important than the coder when the coder is actually doing the, you know, mm -hmm. the legwork? And so yes. that's why I was thinking about, oh, hey, maybe maybe looking at agency would be really interesting to sort of look at how these things pan out and what it actually means to, to have something that's legible, right? Yes. Um, and, and then again, when you talked about uh, the double-edged sword, you know, the creative and the legible, mm -hmm. that's like, oh, yeah. that's a really interesting <laughs> concept, tension to explore. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so in case of Victory VAR to deal with this issue. So I really agree that uh, the value of, so the value of the complex design and really simple design, they are both really great design. So the thing is, so, so, so that's why we try to allow the users to use the really primitive, simple design, and also to use the C# or Grasshopper and after word. But the thing is, we try to make the user interface as simple as possible to for user friendly way to send the data to the PC or you know design to the phone. So because you know if there's a huge number of buttons on the cell phone, then you, you do not have space to click on the AR environment. So in that point of view, kind of user interface point of view, the complexity, so we should we try our best to make it simple and just leave the buttons and boxes for just for the functions and use your functions for the user. Yeah, and so, yeah, and this kind of user interface also related to the simplification of the coding environment like in the end in the really back into the 90s or 80s we used the C or SQL plus but now we use Python and C Java and so on. So maybe this kind of this kind of process is also making the language more easy use having really easy user user interface. So in that kind of perspective of view our project should try to be as simple as possible in that point of view, not the design, simple design for pursuing only simple design, but you know, only for the user interface point of view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah what, you're saying, what you're saying is interesting because um, last, last year we were working with a student looking at sort of the same issues, but specifically situated in BIM. So when you have building information modeling, you can just, you know, you use Revit and you have everything, but then is that architecture? You know, that's a massive question. You know, like what's the core of the discipline and how the tool actually embeds that core or that transformation. You know, like there's there's a lot of assumptions and uh, it's just, again, tensions and tensions. It's like, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I can define the what is the architecture or design means, then I'll be really great also. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so. I would like uh, good, good night to all. I would like to say that, that uh, 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 it's interesting that question of the design process. 
okay, between simplicity and, and complexity because it, it, uh, no doubt about that simplicity it, it must, must be a goal in our design process in order to facilitate our job. And also uh, in the case of the presentation of the, of the uh, AR Vitruvius, that it, it, I, I give you my congrats to you because I, I, I enjoyed what the, the presentation and I think it's very useful work because it, in, a, in a sense, it is a kind of uh, the, the democratizing the kind of democracy in the design. It's possible to design in the in the in the in the in the, in, the, in, in real time to sketch in real time for for, for any user. I think it's a it's a very um, uh, a very open gesture to, the, to 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 give access to the design to 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 different users and. The, uh, and regarding the, that question of simplicity and complexity, I think it's challenging because uh, uh, with simplicity we can we can we can uh, in a more in a more simple way to 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 establish a design process. But also complexity, it's also it's also challenging in our know, because 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 in creativity process with 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 the, with the complexity and with with the challenging that we that we that we face. We can be creative as, as well, and to to uh, and it is a challenge for ourselves also. So uh, I, I I also question myself that uh, when we are simplifying the process, it's it's good absolutely, but uh, but um, uh, in, in in to to maybe uh, in some point. We, we we have to to to, to push our creativity uh, as well to, to, uh, in in facing with difficult in in other ways. I think it, it's 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 uh, exciting. Let's say on this way also for that aspect, uh, reading with simplicity and complexity. Both mm -hmm. both both the things are are are, are, are good for, for creativity. Um, I, it's my point of view. And uh, I think that um, that 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 we if we lose the, the it's good to lose the complexity in the design process. But if we lose that complexity, uh, maybe we lose some power of creativity when we, we deal with some difficulties. And we maybe we have to 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 to, to push for for ourselves and for our creativity in, in other ways that uh, it's challenging as well. Absolutely, yeah. So I think Luis uh, has uh, his hand oh, yeah. raised. So in our case, we we were trying to uh, I don't know if that's a real word, but complexified maps or how we map the university. So when 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 you see a campus, you always have the buildings that made it and you rarely see the action that happens that's not the aim of a map. So we, we were trying to, uh, to put in our diagram how we can see the politics of, of the infrastructures we were, we were like representing or how we can see the action that goes through it. Like uh, there's a quote from, uh, I guess it's Killer Easterling from, from Yale. She says that, Infrastructure is action and it's also materiality. It's like bits and cables and concrete. So how we can represent it? How can we see all the complexity that happens in a university campus that in our case in Brazil and many today we're facing a huge uh, economical crisis. How these institutions help society uh, through hospitals and through another services that happens but not only in uh, enclosed spaces or in closed departments there are the institutions and the organizations that today form the university as a whole so we we were looking to that so we were trying to see uh, what is the politics and what are the actions that occur in our university that is not being seen like all infrastructures, uh, name it, a road, a bridge, they have politics. They are doing something instead of just being there. Like a road is doing something instead of just uh, uh, 
allowing flow in it. So we were kind of looking to that and we are trying to make our maps more complex. So that's why we we use diagrams. So we were kind of looking through uh, Mohan's books and, and writings to do that. So that's kind of our philosophical approach to that. But we were also looking at the politics of the artifacts by Wiener. So th that's that's our approach to, to the complexity theme. So, uh, I would like to say also that uh, when we were talking about uh, vernacular and, and popular approximations, I find it really, uh, really cool that uh, both the GSD article and, and the article from Victor and Ana used uh, common devices. I mean, today in Brazil, uh, I'm pretty sure that almost uh, the majority of people access internet through smartphones and through really simple smartphones. I guess that's pretty cool that, that you can uh, build in uh, considering that those kind of devices. So it's it's a common way and it's it's a really cultural phenomenon nowadays. So congrats on that. Thanks. Thank you, Liz, for, for that. I think it's a, it's a very good approach to, to understand this relationship, this paradox about uh, complexity and, and reducing the complexity when you talk about mapping and, and this, uh, this paradox of, of how the map is not the territory, as we know. And, and I, was thinking about, I was thinking about if you know the work of iconoclasistas. Ooh, that's interesting. Because I think it will be helpful. Uh, sorry? Only by name. Uh, Only by name. I, th I think it will, be, it will be nice if you can take a look at uh, the work because I, th I think that they introduced or reintroduced some, let's say, um, uh, cultural and social and anthropological um, variables uh, to that um, challenge of, of mapping things. And, and even this, this uh, it, in a way, it comes back to that question of, of Leonardo, how to be aware or how to, um, how to take information uh, from the, the people itself and not, not only from data and numbers. I think the in a way it, it relates with with that. So we are kind of um, um, over the time uh, that we have here for for the conversation, but it was a great conversation. It was. Awesome. I mean, I, I learned a lot, and and I thank you all for this opportunity to know your work and to have this amazing conversation here. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Leonardo, for your help. And we will see each other in the conference, I hope. Thank yes. you. All right. Very nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See ya.